verses 11 through 26 of Matthew chapter 27 have been perhaps the, the chief source for persistent anti-Semitism within our faith. And this has been so for as much as 1,800 years. The question these verses have alleged to deal with is, who's responsible for Christ's death? Who's responsible for Christ's death? And by a large margin, institutional Christianity says the answer is the Jews as a people. And thus God has transferred all the blessings of the covenants he's made with them to the Gentile church while leaving the Jews with all the curses. Yet that by no means was even a question that Matthew intended to raise or to answer. In this section, we find three identifiable persons or groups of persons involved in the decision to execute Jesus of Nazareth. The Jewish religious leadership of both the temple and the synagogue authorities, the Roman prefect over the Roman province of Judea, Pontius Pilate, and the Jewish crowds that stood before him on that fateful Passover day. All agreed to send Yeshua to the cross. Now the crowds, as typical of mobs, were rather easy to manipulate because certain recognized leaders knew how to prey on their already explosive emotions, which rose high and spread like volcanic ash during all the pilgrimage feasts. So what caused the mob to turn against Jesus? Verse 20 says, But the head Kohanim, the head priest, persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas' release and have Yeshua executed on the stake. We have our answer. Once again, we find that the leadership are the culprits. Even so, the crowds cannot be absolved from their participation. They are given the choice of having the, the notorious and known murderer, Barabba, freed as a Passover gift from Pilate. Or they could have chosen to have the innocent Christ released. They chose Barabba, Barabbas in most Bibles, and even vowed before God to accept any penalty that might come from their choice. But even more than this penalty from God, should there be a because for it, in other words, a curse in Jewish thought, that curse would extend to their children. Now, clearly this was not a serious or well-thought-out expression of the sureness of their choice, or a consequence they were actually willing to bear, but rather one brought on by a reckless frenzy fomented by the Jewish religious leadership. Matthew's point was to make a historic recollection of how Jesus' formal condemnation occurred and the execution proceeded as opposed to trying to point a finger of blame for it. In fact, so far, it's the Jewish religious leadership that Yeshua has indicted for the spiritual state of the naive and misinformed common people. Since it's the leadership that is tasked with properly instructing them in God's laws and commandments. And yet, the misinformed cannot claim innocence. When finally, they're shown God's truth, but they prefer to stick with what the falsehoods they have previously known. Bottom line, a mob cannot be representative of an entire population 
can't be representative of a race of people or any kind of a people group. Nor can the general population be held responsible for the decisions of a corrupt and perverse leadership that causes violence to happen. Especially in a first century political environment when leaders were not chosen or elected by the people, but rather leadership offices were handed down within families or they were bought and paid for or even acquired through subterfuge. Thus, the common people cannot be held accountable for that. Therefore, placing blame for Christ's death on the Jews or on the Roman Gentiles is a red herring. Certainly not the point that Matthew was making. Therefore, it's not something that we today ought to be distracted with as we study the Passion narrative. All right, let's read a little bit more now of Matthew chapter 27. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to start at verse 26. Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 26. Then he released to them Barabbas, but Yeshua, after having him whipped, he handed over to be executed on a stake. The governor's soldiers took Yeshua into the headquarters building, and the whole battalion gathered around him. They stripped off his clothes and put, him, put on him a scarlet robe, wove thorn branches into a crown, and put it on his head, and put a stick in his right hand. Then they kneeled down in front of him, and they made fun of him. Hail to the king of the Jews! And they spit on him, and they used the stick to beat him around the head. And when they'd finished ridiculing him, they took off the robe, put his own clothes back on him, led him away to be nailed to the execution stake. As they were leaving, they met a man from Cyrene named Shimon, Simon, and they forced him to carry Yeshua's execution stake. And when they arrived at a place called Gulgota, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with bitter gall to drink. But after tasting it, he wouldn't drink it. And after they had nailed him to the stake, they divided his clothes among them by throwing dice. And then they sat down to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they placed the written notice stating the charge against him. This is Yeshua, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were placed on an execution stakes with him, one on the right, one on the left. And people passing by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you can destroy the temple, can you, and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself if you're the Son of God. Come down from the stake. And likewise, the head Kohanim, the head priest, jeered at him, along with the Torah teachers and the elders. Well, he saved others, but he can't save himself. So, he's the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the stake, then we'll believe him. He trusted God, so let him rescue him if he wants him. After all, he did say, I'm the son of God. Even the robbers nailed up with him, insulted him in the same way. Now, I've mentioned in earlier lessons that all the gospel accounts about Yeshua's death, use only a couple of pages or so to uh, speak of it. Matthew especially is quite brief and, and concise in telling us what transpired. See, the, the trial and death of Yeshua, even the aftermath, is almost anticlimactic for these gospel writers. And, and it's something that we need to Deeply ponder. While it is a church mantra that ab about all that matters for a Christian is Christ's death and resurrection, then why does the New Testament spend so little time with it? I'd like to think that the um, 90 plus lessons in Matthew 
that we've so far studied together uh, answers that question. Who he was historically, what he represents, what he taught us, this is all equally important as his death and his resurrection. Now, if we were to go by the volume of inspired writings on the matter, the former is even more important than the latter. Now, don't mistake what I'm suggesting. I'm in no way meaning that his death and resurrection are not the defining moment in which salvation from our sins became a possibility for us. Rather, it is that it's not an either-or situation. We can't, on the one hand, claim salvation based on our faith in his death and arising from the grave, if we, on the other hand, determine to largely ignore living out that salvation in the way he tells us we are obligated to do. Or as Yeshua's biological brother James put it in James 2, 19 through 26, you believe that God is one. Well, good for you. The demons believe it too. And the thought makes them shudder with fear. But foolish fellow, do you want to be shown that such faith apart from actions is barren? Wasn't Abraham Avenu, Abraham our father, declared righteous because of actions when he offered up his son Isaac, Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith worked out with his actions. By the actions, the faith was made complete. And the passage of the Tanakh, Old Testament, was fulfilled, which says, Avraham had faith in God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness. He was even called God's friend. You see that a person is declared righteous because of actions, not because of faith alone. Likewise, wasn't Rahab, wasn't Rahab, the prostitute also declared righteous because of actions when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another route. Indeed, just as the body without a spirit is dead, so too faith without actions is dead. James uses a wonderful metaphor to help us understand the importance of following through with the actions that Christ told us to do. That of, he uses the, the, the relationship between the body and spirit. Now, when he says spirit, he's referring to the invisible life force that makes us living beings. So if faith in Christ's death and resurrection represents the body, then doing what he taught us to do represents the spirit. If we don't do what he taught us to do, then the body's dead because there is no spirit, there is no life force to make our faith alive. James doesn't put one above the other. Both are important and required in equal measure. Verse 27 initiates the sequence of moving Christ to the cross. The governor's soldiers, meaning Roman soldiers, took over now. Jews were no longer part of the process. Now, although we can't come up with a number, there were more than a few soldiers surrounding Yeshua, no doubt because his impending death was so controversial, and it was the Feast of Passover when messianic fervor was at a fever pitch in Jerusalem. They began by removing his standard peasant Jew garb, and they put a scarlet robe on him. Where was Jesus at this moment? Where in Jerusalem was he? It was likely at one of two places, either the Antonia Fortress that was located on the temple grounds, or it was at the former Herod's palace in the upper city, where, where Pilate stayed when he was in Jerusalem. You see, Pilate's actual home was located in Caesarea Maritima, which is located on the Mediterranean Sea, north of Jerusalem. And that's where he resided most of the time. 
He only came to Jerusalem at the times of the feasts in order to make sure there weren't riots or maybe when some kind of official business was necessary there. Anyway, Matthew's gospel says a scarlet robe was put on to Jesus, but Mark says it was purple. Mark was not correct. Purple was a color used mostly by royalty, but where would the Romans have obtained a purple robe? Scarlet was the color of a centurion's robe or cape. No doubt the centurion in charge of the cohort lent his scarlet cape to be put onto Jesus as a mock royal robe in order to make fun of him. And to further humiliate him, they took some kind of a vine that had thorns on it and they wove it into a mock crown. Well, when we see the diadem, look at this picture, it's associated. When we see the sort of diadem that was worn by, worn by Roman emperors, then we realize that this is what the soldiers were imitating. Since Jewish kings wore metal crowns of gold, they also handed him some type of a reed to imitate a king's scepter. Now, whatever these items were, they were at immediate hand. There's no feasible way that these rough soldiers planned this humiliation in advance or they took the time to go seek out these various items to place on Yeshua. Now, to complete this comedy, they knelt down before Christ and said, Hail to the King of the Jews! See, when we back away from the scene, and when we, we see what happens once he's nailed to the cross, we understand that as far as the soldiers know, and as far as Pilate was concerned, Yeshua's crime was his claim as being a king. In the Roman Empire, this was the highest form of treason. Only Caesar could be king. Thus, while the Jewish Sanhedrin convicted him of blasphemy, they knew better than to take that charge to Pilate. Rather, they told Pilate that Christ claimed to be a king knowing that this was the surest way to get Pilate to agree to condemn him, because then this made Jesus a threat to Roman sovereignty. And as we've discussed on numerous occasions, from an earthly standpoint, from a purely historical standpoint, Jesus died as a political prisoner for political reasons. You know, what's so interesting and ironic is that in truth, Jesus was the king of the Jews. And he stated as much when he claimed the role of Messiah, which was understood by the Jewish people since ages past, that he would be a new Davidic king. Now, the Roman soldier spat on Yeshua. Spitting upon him was then, just as it remains today, one of the worst acts of contempt. Now, culturally, it was an infliction of great shame to be spat upon. Thus, as he continues his journey to the cross, he's now in a societal state of shame, as far as Jewish society is concerned. The soldiers took the, the reed or the, the stick, whatever it was, from his hand. They lashed him with it. And when they had finished their physical and psychological abuse, they removed the cloak from him and probably gave it back to the Roman centurion that lent it. All right, backing up a little bit. Verse 26 had told us that he was whipped. Now, what this means is flogged. Flogging was a truly terrible experience and something that was regularly done to prisoners that were going to be crucified because it was bound to hurry along the dying process. Flogging involved hitting a person over and over again with a device called a flagellum that had multiple leather arms on it. And at the end of each of these arms were bits of metal or sharpened bone that would tear into the flesh and rip it. Profuse bleeding, along with intense pain 
was the result. It was not unusual for a man to die during the flogging. Now, obviously, Jesus survived it. But what comes next tells us that he was greatly weakened by it. Verse 32 tells the story of a Jewish man from Cyrene named Shimon that was forcibly enlisted to carry Christ's cross. Now, the picture of this event is one of the most popular painted by Christian artists. However, the idea that Yeshua truly carried his own cross is just not tenable. The Roman execution stake was huge. No single man could have carried it. Rather, what he carried was the cross beam. And this beam, called a patibulum, was usually tied to the condemned prisoner's arms, and he more or less carried it on his shoulders to the site of his impending crucifixion. Now, part of the reason for this procedure was to further publicly disgrace him, but also to be a very visible warning to any Jew that would think to oppose Rome. Further, it would exhaust the, the prisoner, and as he hung on the cross, it would reduce his ability to push up with his legs to lessen the agony of not being able to breathe well. Again, in a cruel way, it might hasten the death process. In any case, some random Jewish person from among the onlookers was grabbed by the Roman soldiers and was made to carry the cross beam as Yeshua was simply unable to after being flogged and beaten so severely. Cyrene was a city that lay on the coast of what we call today Libya. It already had in the er as early as the 4th century BC a substantial Jewish population, no doubt as a result of Israel's exiles. Shimon was but one of scores of thousands of Jewish pilgrims in town for the peace of Passover and unleavened bread and, and first fruits. Well, Mark's gospel further identifies this particular Shimon, which was a very popular and widely used Jewish name, as the father of Alexander and Rufus. And indeed, Shimon would just arrived to Jerusalem when he saw this disturbance happening. I mean, talk about bad timing. All right? and, and, and such a reference might indicate that Shimon lived in Cyrene, but Alexander and Rufus were locals. Well, the place where the crucifixion would take place is called Gultada, Gulgota. It's an Aramaic word that means skull, or in our passage, it would be fair to call it the place of the skull. Now, the Latin Vulgate Bible translated this to Calvaria, from which we get the English word Calvary. So does the term Gulgota, as indicating skull, does that mean that the place where it happened somehow looked like a skull? Or was a kind of a macabre name for a nondescript place where hundreds, probably thousands, of crucifixions happened? Uh, I'm not going to really venture a guess, since there is no way to know for sure, and one guess is probably as good as another. Where exactly this place was located in Jerusalem is another issue. To be clear, however, keep in mind there's a difference between where he was crucified and where he was entombed. Gordon's Calvary is currently the most popular guess as to where he was crucified. There's a rock formation there that does have some re resemblance to a skull. Now, whether it looked like that 2,000 years ago, that's another matter. A couple hundred yards away is what today is called the Garden Tomb. This is a place, some think, Jesus was buried. Another candidate for his burial place is where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is built. Now, I, I truly don't have any better opinion on the matter than do the many scholars who have chimed in on it over the centuries. What I do know, though, 
is that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, as we see it today, wasn't built until the Crusader era. Prior to that, there was a building there that was an edifice dedicated to the Roman Emperor Constantine. That had been built over an edifice to the Roman Emperor Hadrian, such as the way religious sites have worked over the centuries. In Christ's era, this place lay outside the walls of Jerusalem. And since neither a place of execution nor a place of burial would have been allowed inside the city walls, then the place of the Holy Sepulchre can't be ruled out. On the other hand, it seems the most unlikely place for a tomb, but it's not out of the question. Therefore, the place called the Garden Tomb, to which I've taken many tour guests, is the more likely location of his burial. And it's adjacent to the place that has a cliff that looks like a skull. Now, the irony of it is that today, both of these sites lay outside the Damascus Gate of the old city of Jerusalem, meaning they're in a Muslim area. In fact, a bus station um, used mostly by Muslims was built many years ago immediately below the cliff that looks a bit like a skull. Wherever the execution took place, it must have been very public. There were, had to have been roads and paths that went by it for easy access because the Romans wanted it to be highly visible to as many people as possible. And finally, it had to be well outside the walls of Jerusalem because as a place of death, it was ritually unclean. And the Romans would have honored that in order to keep the peace. Beyond that, will likely never know exactly where Christ was crucified or buried. Now, Matthew's gospel says that before he was nailed to the stake, he was offered a mixture of wine with something called gall. Now, gall is really more of a description of something bitter or not very good tasting than it is the name of a particular substance. Mark says the actual substance in the wine was myrrh. Now, myrrh was a narcotic when ingested. Mark says the actual substance, wine, probably with a high alcohol, mixed with myrrh, was intended as an act of mercy to, to dull the pain. Now, this too was rather standard Roman practice. Recall that crucifixion was reserved strictly for Jews. It was not a form of execution used on Gentiles, at least not in the Holy Land. Yeshua refused to drink it. Why? Good question. Some of the evangelical branches of the church say it was because it was wine that contained alcohol. <laughs> of course, these are the same branches that don't believe that the wine mentioned in the New Testament or that Christ used at the Lord's Supper was actual wine. It was just grape juice which if one knows much of anything about Jewish first century society and Torah ritual practices, it is that low alcohol content wine drinking was normal and customary. None of the gospel writers explains Yeshua's refusal of the painkiller, and we're not going to attempt to do it either. But they do all agree this is what happened. Now, after he refused the narcotic painkiller, Yeshua was nailed to the Roman staros, the Roman style, execution stake that Christians call a cross. A victim being nailed to the stake, that was actually the usual practice. There's this mistaken belief among many Christians that Jesus' crucifixion was unique, partially because they used nails through his, his wrists and through his feet to make it extra gruesome instead of tying his hands and feet to the stake using a rope. A heel bone with a spike through it and dated to that time period has been found to prove the point. The gospel writers all speak of Christ being nailed to the cross eh, matter-of-factly, and then they just move on. 
In other words, nothing unusual to see here. Well, as the nailing was going on, some of the soldiers took Yeshua's garments and they played a dice game for them. Now, none of them could have seriously wanted this peasant Jew's garments. They didn't have any value. But it was apparently a kind of Roman custom among soldiers to do this. The mention of it is actually likely to highlight the fulfillment of yet another messianic prophecy that we find in the Psalms. Psalms 22, 17 through 19. Dogs are all around me. A pack of villains closes in on me like a lion at my hands and my feet. I can count every one of my bones while they gaze at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves. For my clothing, they throw dice. Next, the Roman soldiers handling the executions that day sat down to wait as the ones hanging up on the execution stakes slowly expired. Now, verse 37 makes plain what we talked about a little earlier. A sign was placed above Yeshua's head telling what the charge against him was. It said, this is Yeshua, king of the Jews. Now, it was usual that a sign would be created and hung around the neck of the condemned, stating what offense had been committed. Yet, assuming all our gospel writers got it correct, good assumption, the sign was placed above the head of Christ, and it was a, less, um, a list of charges, more continued ridicule and mocking of him. In other words, it was meant for the Jews who passed by to see and to take heed, to forget this messiah, messiah, uh, messiah figure, rather. All right, some hope would lead a rebellion against Rome and then become the first Jewish king in many centuries. See, the message was this. This is what will happen to any Messiah that happens to show up. Submit to Rome. You have no hope. That was the message. And since a sign was placed above Jesus' head, there had to be at least a little bit of a vertical post that rose up higher than the horizontal crossbeam. So even though most historical illustrations of a Roman death stake have it in the shape of a capital T, apparently there was a few inches of the post above it. Either way, the shape of the cross as we know it today was in no way like it was in that era. In fact, the earliest use of a cross as a Christian symbol was in the 300s AD based on the Greek letter tau. Later, Constantine promoted this kind of cross as the official Christian symbol. Obviously, the cross is nothing that the early Jewish believers could ever have possibly accepted because it was symbolic of the most barbaric form of execution used on them. And while accepted by most branches of Christianity, the exact shape of a cross uh, very significantly across various branches. The Bible never pushes forward the idea of a wooden cross as a God-given symbol of Christianity, or even as something to remember Christ by. See, the cross is a Christian tradition. It's an ancient custom. It's not a biblical command. It's not even a recommended biblical icon. The cross is and has been far too much used as a symbol of Gentile church superiority or in some cases, downright bigotry against Jews. It is far past time to rethink some of the symbols that, while having become entrenched as holy in Christian institutions, are in the end just tradition-based icons. And when the use of the cross causes great hurt to our Jewish brothers and sisters in the faith, and for good reason, and this creates a strong wall of separation. You know, we need to carefully think through 
the value of using it. And I want to be clear, I'm not anti-cross. I understand that most well-meaning Christians aren't intending it as an insult to Jews. But when we know that it is offensive for what it means for them, and when our most basic <laughs> biblical command is to love our fellow man as we love ourselves, then we have to ask if the insistence upon using certain symbols doesn't do more harm than good in promoting faith in Yeshua, in Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, Yeshua was the Jewish Messiah. Enough said. Verse 38 explains that two robbers, or thieves, were placed upon their own crosses next to Yeshua, one on either side of him. Now, the Greek word used for the two criminals is lestes. It carries the general meaning of a thief, but somehow that doesn't really fit with this scenario. See, Rome did not execute common thieves. They were crucified. So whatever these men did, it extended well beyond mere thievery. Some language scholars think the term is broad enough to include the kind of robbers that attack and even kill people to steal from them, what we today call armed robbery. So we must not think of a couple of poverty-stricken Jews who stole bread or a fish to feed themselves or their families. These were men who had committed serious offenses that very likely involved harming people. Eh, perhaps they were thought to be Jewish rebels. Now, the charge of some of the Jewish onlookers of saying that Jesus was going to destroy the temple then and build it back in three days mostly results from a misunderstanding of what he had earlier said and meant. He meant it prophetically. He meant it in a couple of different senses. He knew that a few years later the temple would be destroyed. The building itself, you see, had become so sacred to the Jewish people and the historical memory of it having been destroyed by the Babylonians, so hateful for them, that the thought of Jesus implying that he was going to destroy the temple, something he did not say, now it brought on instant anger. Now we've already heard about people swearing, making vows, using the temple itself as the guaranteeing third party, almost as if it was alive. The only real value to the temple had always been is the place of God's presence on earth at the moments he chose to be there. Otherwise, it stood empty except of furniture. And since the Babylonian exile and the rebuilding of the temple, not even the Ark of the Covenant was present any longer. The building itself was viewed as a holy place even as today, the foundation walls for a temple in Jerusalem that hasn't existed for nearly 20 centuries, the Western Wall, the Kotel, is considered holy by religious Jews. Well, of the many passers-by of this highly visible place of crucifixion, some hurled insults at Yeshua. Some shook their heads at him, mocked him, as did the Roman soldiers. This, too is prophetic fulfillment. Psalms, back to the Psalms, Psalms 22, verses 7 through 8. But I am a worm, not a man. I'm scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me jeer at me. They sneer, they shake their heads. See, it's interesting that in Mark's gospel, that the insults hurled at Yeshua are called blaspheming, which clearly is not meant by Mark in its most technical function. And yet, while in the Peshat sense, the, the, the literal, the simplest sense, these are but offensive slurs 
aimed at Christ. In the remez sense, the deeper sense, the hint sense, these passers-by actually are committing blasphemy in its fullest biblical function because they're saying these foul and slanderous things to the divine. In truth, this understanding of blaspheming Jesus can only be discovered in the, with the benefit of hindsight, and yet he regularly showed his fellow Jews his divine side through the incomparable miracles he facilitated because he outright said he was divine by defining himself, identifying himself countless times as the Son of Man. The people were just blinded to it by their centuries of man-made traditions that had obscured the truth. Well, among the many scorning words thrown at Yeshua included, okay, if you're the Son of God, come down from that cross. Such wicked words cannot help us from remembering something similar said to him much earlier in the book of Matthew. Way back in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, we read this. The tempter, the devil, Satan. The tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, order these stones to become bread. But he answered, The Tanakh says, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of Adonai. Then the adversary took him to the holy city, and set him up on the highest point of the temple, if you're the Son of God, jump. For the Tanakh says he'll order his angels to be responsible for you. They'll support you with their hands so that you will not hurt your feet on the stones. The connection's unmistakable. Unmistakable. These jeers are acting as Satan's agents towards Jesus, even using the same word formula. Earlier, Satan tempted Yeshua when he was hungry. Then he tempted him to prove himself by jumping off a high place. Now these people are telling Jesus to climb down off that cross. If he really is who he says he is. All these temptations have to do with Christ gaining something for himself. Whether it's bread to satisfy his hunger, or performing a high dive to obtain a kingdom Satan says he'll give to him. Now it's time to come down from the cross, to ease his personal suffering, to avert death. And when these same jeers tell Christ to save himself, they don't mean it in the sense of salvation, as we think of it. Rather, it is in the sense of saving himself from agony and death. They know nothing about any claim of spiritual deliverance through him. Well, next we're told that Jewish religious figures mocked him. Now, I suspect at least some of these were members of the Sanhedrin that had pronounced the death sentence on him, and they wanted to come and view this, this dark spectacle to satisfy themselves that their will was being carried out by Rome. And like the other jeers, they say something like, he can save others, but he can't save himself. And they say, if he is who he claims to be, then come down off that cross. You know, I wonder, might any of us in that era, based on what seemed to have been the available information at that time, have understood the idea of saving in the sense of personal salvation from our sins? Even Christ's 12 disciples didn't seem to get it. So while we can study our New Testaments and benefit from the many fine teachings given to us by excellent teachers and pastors, and understand from a distance of time what these words and events meant in the larger spiritual, if not cosmic realm, it simply was not so obvious to the Jews of that day. These Jewish leaders, no doubt playing to others around them, say that the proof they demand of Yeshua being the Son of God is for him to come down off that death stake. In other words, they're asking for another sign. His response to the demand of a sign 
The first time it was thrust upon him was never more appropriate than at this moment, back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 40. At this, some of the Torah teachers said, Rabbi, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. And he replied, a wicked and rebellious generation asks for a sign? No, none will be given to you but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of the Man be Son of Man be three days and three nights in the depths of the earth. The sign of Jonah. Being entombed three days, three nights. This was the only sign necessary. Well, even more prophetic words from Psalm 22 are fulfilled at the vile utterances of the Jewish religious leaders. When they say that since Jesus claims to trust God so much, then let God rescue him from his crucifixion. Psalm 22, verse 9. He committed himself to Adonai, so let him rescue him. Let him set him free if he takes such delight in him. Even the criminals who are dying on their crosses on either side of Yeshua join in the insults. You know, it makes me think of people who have resisted Christ all their lives. They're moments from death. And when they're offered the opportunity to know him and be forgiven and saved, still refuse it, almost as a stubborn badge of honor. Where there's whatever saving is going to be done, I'll do it myself. Let's read a few more verses. Pick your Bibles back up again. Go back to chapter 27. We're going to start, read, start reading at verse 45. It's going to read six verses. From noon until three o'clock in the afternoon, all the land was covered with darkness. At about three, Yeshua uttered a loud cry. Eli, Eli, lama shavaktani. My God, my God, why have you deserted me? On hearing this, some of the bystanders said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, soaked it in vinegar, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, wait, wait, let's see if Elijah comes and rescues him. But Yeshua, again crying out in a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. Matthew records... that from about noon to three in the afternoon that day, as Messiah hung on the death stake, all the land was covered in darkness. This must be referring to the famous prophecy of Amos. Amos, chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Won't the land tremble for this and everyone born who lives in the land? It will all rise, just like the Nile, be in turmoil, subside, like the Nile in Egypt. And when that time comes, says Adonai Elohim, I will make the sun go down at noon. I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your festivals into mourning, all your songs into wailing. I will make you all put sackcloth around your waists, shave your heads bald in grief. I will make it like mourning for an only son and its end like a bitter day. You know what's so dazzling about this prophecy is not only the mention of the sun going down at noon and darkening the whole land, but that God will turn the festivals into a time of mourning. What is Israel joyously celebrating at the moment of Christ's execution. The three springtime festivals. See, the reality of recognizing prophetic fulfillment is that it is often missed because it's not taken literally enough. Some of the prophetic predictions are so difficult for us to fathom or seem so impossible in and of themselves to happen that we look for another meaning. 
then they happen. Just as it was stated, and God's people miss it. That's what was happening with the Jewish people of the first century. See, let's, let's not let that happen among ourselves. As the end times approaches along with the many prophetic fulfillments that accompany it. Well, was this three-hour darkness actual, tangible darkness? Did the sun become obscured? Or is this meant symbolically? What land is this speaking about? Jerusalem? Judea? All the Holy Land? The entire earth? See, darkness is a biblical term for evil or for God's impending wrath. Could the sky have also darkened from some unusual weather event? A sky so dark, it unnerved the people. See, the evil that was occurring, which borders on an evil that might be the worst in human history, to that point, crucifying Jesus, the Son of God, could be what the gospel writers intended. Or perhaps it was the portent of the wrath of God that was going to, in a matter of minutes, be poured out in a most unexpected and devastating way. The term the land is just as problematic because biblically it ranges in scope from the city of Jerusalem at its narrowest all the way up to the Holy Land at its most general. It was the final moments of this darkness when Yeshua released his spirit and he died. But not before his father poured out his wrath upon his son. And that will be the opening topic of our discussion next week. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose, holylandmarketplace.com. For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at torahclass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.